there are certain icons within the iconic images within the movie that that transcend time and I think they're incredibly consciously created by him and I think they're absolutely specifically there in order to try and create something that is far bigger than the movie to transcend the period you don't have to be a genius to 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 watch the boys in Clockwork Orange walking down the riverbank in slow motion and mentally cut between that and Reservoir Dogs as the black suited men walk in slow motion down the street from uh, Kurosawa to Magnificent Seven, the, almost the sense of the mythical group of men moving through a landscape which is barren and somehow unbelievably sexy. To me, it's actually very prophetic of punk, of the things that in the mid-70s punk would be uh, feeding off, which was the notion of anarchy, working-class violence, and also ju just the, the sheer landscape of the film, which is that very interesting futuristic kind of stylish, but it's, it's also a concrete tower block. Modernity, Council Flat. Thamesmead. Is it Thamesmead? It's a real place, right? We just filmed there. And he was saying, where the hell is this? You know, it's kind of great. Uh, it's still there. There was a kid at our school who came to school with a copy of Clockwork Orange, the book, and I think he'd been given it to read, you know, as a sort of sixth form project. And we all knew that it was something, you know, subversive and dark, because we all knew there was a film of it that we weren't allowed to see. And the cover of the book at that point had a cartoon image of a face with a clockwork eye, very much like the Malcolm McDowell eye makeup, but inspired by it. And I just remember the guy reading that thing on the coach and thinking this is something very, very dark and very subversive, very, but I don't know anything about it. But it was, even then, we knew it was forbidden. There's a kind of an official canon of books about teenagers, which is pro the most obvious one being Catcher in the Rye, that you'll get kind of given to read at school. Um, and that's superficially about kind of teenage rebellion. And it's, yes, it's a great book, but what you really want to read, I think, at that age is something that, you're, that you'd never get given at school. And the thing that you'll get passed among your mates under the desk is Clockwork Orange. Anthony Burgess had a most peculiar attitude to a Clockwork Orange. He had written it. He had written it out of himself and out of a very unpleasant incident that had happened uh, to one of his previous wives uh, involving rape. And so this act of violence, in a way, um, uh, had a huge effect on Burgess's married life, and I think it was that gratuitous act of violence that was at the back of writing Clockwork Orange. The book was written, I think, in a state of catharsis. I must get it down on paper and nail my demons to the page. He had been told that he had a, a brain tumour that couldn't be operated on, and he sat down and wrote and wrote and wrote, and he wrote, I think, about five books, or the drafts of five books, in a year one of which was A Clockwork Orange. And it has that tremendous uh, sense of momentum uh, that it was written in one go. It is not a typical book. It's a book which uh, deals with violence, especially juvenile violence, uh, and uh, it is fairly graphic. And it was made into a film by Stanley J. Kubrick. Burgess himself was always um, irritated by the disproportionate attention that he, that he felt the, the, the work drew. Um, he didn't regard it as one of his major uh, pieces of uh, literature. Um, but it is an extraordinary example of, of his linguistic brilliance in the, the way he casually almost invents this language, this blend of Russian and English slang. Yarbles! Great bolshe yard blockos to you! Yarbles, testicles. You learn a new language in the course of the book, and for Burgess to know that that was feasible and that people would want to do that, would be drawn into the book enough to want to learn the language, is, is, is I think, the, the sort of real achievement of his career. The language which Burgess saw as really being the, the prime reason for writing the book uh, which he rather felt was missing from the film. In fact, I think he was wrong. I think his language 
enhances it considerably. Happy Polly Lodges. I had something of a pain in the gulliver, so I had to sleep. I didn't see, I didn't see it when I was growing up. I saw it a hell of a lot later on. But I remember kind of wanting to see it because I wasn't allowed to see it. There was like things on TV and you couldn't see them, but there was a kind of a mystery about it. The first time I ever actually saw the film was in the early 1980s. I went to somebody's house and they just got one of the very first video recorders, which at that point was like the size of a small settee. And the first thing that happened was somebody turned up with a pirate copy of Clockwork Orange. And of course, by that point, I mean, I knew the book really well. I knew the music really well. I'd seen the stills on the back of the album. I'd read all the scare stories about how it was this terrible thing. Finally, you were going to get to see it. What we actually saw was a very fudgy fifth generation, almost entirely orange copy of the video with, I think, Japanese or German subtitles. And even in that terribly degraded state, it seemed to be something exceptional. I bought it under the counter at my local video store. They just happened to have a, a, a notice that said, you know, Clockwork Orange available through us. And, you know, you sent off to Paris and it came through in a brown envelope and it felt vaguely illegal and illicit. It was like this band film that you couldn't see and it's like, you, you know, someone's got a copy of it and you've got someone's house and you watch it on video and it's like, oh, wow, have you got a clockwork orange? You can go see it. It wasn't until about two years ago that I watched it and I saw it on video and I've still never seen it projected, actually. Um, and, uh, and I just marvelled at the number of times I had seen things from it stolen. What struck me looking at this film is that this film is so radical. This, this film is truly disturbing, truly extreme. I can't believe a studio made this film. But I guess at the time, it, the 70s were so different, and in a way more, it reminded me that the 70s were a more liberal time. The 60s were the age of sexual experiment and liberation. The 1970s was certainly the decade of violence, and A Clockwork Orange, to some extent, spoke for the people who were the apostles of violence. The interesting thing about that period in the early 1970s was it was very contradictory. On the one hand, there was an awful lot of panicking. There was panicking about this, there was panicking about The Exorcist, you know, films which had that kind of reputation. On the other hand, it was probably the most open period of film censorship in Britain. I think it was halfway through 1971 that Ken Russell's film, The Devils, opened. And The Devils is a catechism of demonic violence. We had to cut The Devils. It really was way over the top. And then, of course, the month before we saw A Clockwork Orange, we had In Straw Dogs, which again was a, a film that caused com tremendous comments in the press. It had violence, it had marauders in the neighbourhood, it had rape, and it created a tremendous stare in the media. Movies were coming along that were challenging councils, that were challenging the government, that people in local government and in, you know, mainstream government were sort of getting very uppity about, but that film censorship itself and the British Board of Film Classification, film censorship as, as they were then, were saying, no, we ought to allow this stuff to thrive. We did have Kubrick's track record to go back on, and we knew we were looking at a major film. And uh, whatever one may think about board censorship, we normally do not like cutting films of great merit. It's well known that a famous director through the 60s, John Trevelyan, used quite frequently to not just uh, engage in dialogue with the directors, uh, but used to vet the scripts in advance. And indeed, the, the script for uh, Clockwork Orange was seen before the, uh, before the film uh, was seen. Now, it's some time since that kind of prior involvement in a movie or a video or anything that comes through these doors uh, has been uh, has been our habit. We're in the business of dealing with the work as it arrives. The contentious points were all in the first half of the film, uh, starting with the kicking of the tramp by the by the drugs, <laughs> the uh, rape of Adrian Corey, <laughs> and the beating to death of another lady with a giant phallus. Really, the discussion wasn't all that long. No, we we decided that putting it all together it worked as a film and therefore the earlier violence was justified and it was passed without cuts. The Conservative government and the Home Secretary of the day, Reginald Modling, particularly took this to heart. Modling was not a diplomatic man and in the course of an interview with a London evening newspaper, he rashly said that he would like to see a copy of A Clockwork Orange before it opened publicly. Now this was unprecedented. This was the first time a Home Secretary had said, show me the film because I think it might be a dangerous film. Reginald Maudling came to the board. Uh, he had a, an interview with Stephen Murphy, 
and obviously as a result of that interview, at which I was not present, uh, he said he wanted to see the film. The words were no sooner out of Modeling's mouth than he regretted it, but he had to go through with it. Stanley Kubrick and the distributors of the film Warner Brothers suddenly realised they were being put in the dock by no less a person than the Home Secretary of the day. The board was not at all happy that he should see it on the board's premises uh, because it would have looked very much like state censorship, which obviously Reginald Maudling was accused of afterwards. So Bertie Mayles, who was then office manager, took a copy of the film out of the board obviously under the Secretary's instructions. And while the press were in the front in Soho Square, he went out another door, took it down to the Admiralty, where, where Reggie Maudlin saw the film in the Admiralty cinema, and Bertie waited and then brought the film back again. It is very important when you look at A Clockwork Orange today to try and imagine yourself back 30 years in the state of England when A Clockwork Orange came out. <laughs> minor strike and so on, which is part of the textures of your life. It was, um, it's only with a little bit of time intervening that you look back and see it was really quite an extraordinary period to have lived through. The social horizon was literally very dark indeed, round about the turn of the year into 1972, when A Clockwork Orange suddenly hit the screen. And there are all the devils in cinematic form that people felt if they chased off the screen, they would disappear from the streets. itself on the screen, creating a very, very divisive opinion up and down the country. Some local councils banned it, and um, they went to town on it. There was a new censor, Stephen Murphy, who was unsure of his position, inexperienced in his job, not a very diplomatic man, not as diplomatic as his predecessor, John Trevelyan, and Stephen Murphy began to feel the heat. One or two youngsters uh, used as a kind of plea of mitigation that what they did in the way of violence was due to seeing Clockwork Orange. And there was quite an outcry at the time, no question of that. The media were waiting for it. There's no doubt about that. Their appetite had been whetted by films like The Devils and Straw Dogs, and they saw in A Clockwork Orange the opportunity to go to town. And I think that as far as the reaction of the film was concerned, it's true to say there was a kind of unspoken conspiracy that here was the platform we want to sound off about the lawlessness and disorder of England. And what's so stinking about it? It's a stinking world because there's no law and order anymore. When the film came out, Burgess went on air a lot, on television a lot, as it were, instead of Kubrick as a spokesman and defended the film while privately having a lot of reservations about it. I became associated with violence due because of the film, and uh, if a couple of nuns were raped in Berwick-on-Tweed, uh, I would always get a telephone call from a newspaper, you know, Mr Burgess, what do you think of this? They would never telephone you, Stanley, because you keep out of the way. One of the reasons it did create great controversy is that people's fear of uh, what it might bring to their own doorsteps. And ironically, that fear was visited upon Stanley Kubrick because it's a film that did and maybe today still does possess a very mimetic quality that certain people who see it are almost tempted uh, to ape the, um, if not actually the behavior, then certainly the poses, which can be frightening enough, of Alex and his droogs in the film. And Stanley discovered, you know, that there were people whom we are now familiar with called stalkers who felt that if they saw Stanley Kubrick, uh, they could communicate a message to him that would be very valuable, and uh, they would go to his doorstep and uh, demand admission. That's, in fact, what happened. And the uh, Hertfordshire police eventually said to Stanley Kubrick, you know, you have your family here, your wife 
and your three children, and you're living in a rather isolated country house. And at the same time, your film is attracting an almost demonic quantity of attention. Uh, the two things are not good, Mr. Kubrick. You could find the droogs coming to your doorstep too. Who on earth could that be? So Stanley, who always believed in the power of the irrational in the community, acted upon his own advice and withdrew the film uh, right up to his death. If he was truly worried about um, the film's effect or pr provoking uh, violence against him, you'd have thought that he might have withdrawn it everywhere. But, you know, I bought a video... You couldn't buy a videotape of Clockwork Orange in this country. I bought one in New York. So I, so I was able to see the film. Um, so the censorship that existed in Britain over Clockwork Orange seems to me to be deeply curious, and I'm not entirely convinced of, of that explanation. If you ask me, am I aware of a director withdrawing a film and never allowing any version of the film to be shown in the United Kingdom? And particularly, is there an example of somebody doing that in the United Kingdom, but happily allowing it to be shown all over the world? all the time for the best part of 30 years, I think it's unique. Once he'd taken it off the market, there was no way you could turn round and say, oh, actually, you can all have it back again. And uh, it just, its reputation grew with it. What's really annoying is I think a lot of people think that he took it off the market in order to increase its reputation so it could be re-released. I don't think if he died 10 years from now he would have released it. I think he would, I just think he'd, he'd made the decision and that was the end of that. One of the things that shakes people when they first set eyes on a clockwork orange is what hits them in the eardrum. And that's the voice of Malcolm McDowell, which is hard, unforgiving, jeering, almost mocking in a sarcastic way the people that he talks to directly. He talks to camera. And that gets below the consciousness of people who watch the film. In a novel, of course, uh, first-person narration can be hugely unreliable and uh, can, can lead you in all sorts of uh, wrong directions, and writers exploit this all the time. But in cinema, um, when you hear that voice over the images, I think it has one effect. It's, uh, it, is, uh, it becomes intimate, you become, it becomes confessional. Uh, the audience is, in effect, on the side of the narrator. The narration is a funny device because it just pulls the audience in. It makes them part of it. It makes them complicit. He's talking to you. You're his friend, you know. So it's a way of kind of screwing with the audience a bit. You know, you're sort of messing with them a little bit because you're, you're making them intimate with this terrible person. He's incredibly careful about, about the pacing of the voiceover. And, and when it came to, I mean, I'm speaking purely personally here, when it came to doing my film, which also starts with voiceover, and you know, um, he's a lesson in how to use it because uh, it's 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 almost the best piece of acting that Malcolm McDowell does in the entire movie is with his voice because it, it's very hypnotic, very quickly. I was a great admirer of his performance in If, and uh, I didn't wasn't really aware of Burgess particularly, or even Kubrick uh, then. I think I was more drawn to see. I thought Malcolm McDowell was a really charismatic actor. I'd just come off air for Lindsay Anderson, and I was terrified in a way because I wasn't sure how far I could go and asking Lindsay and talking to Lindsay about this. And Lindsay would say, oh, Malcolm, you'll be fine. You always worry about stuff. Yes, I know, of course, I'm neurotic about it, but look, would you mind just looking at the script? And he said, oh, all right, you know, of course, I'll read it. And he did. He said, I don't, really don't understand much about this kind of stuff. I don't know how he's going to do it. I mean, it's extraordinary, really. Um, he said, but Malcolm, there is a scene in If where you come in uh, to the, into the gymnasium to, to be beaten by the whips. And that close-up is how you play Alex. something charming about Alex, despite everything which Kubrick or 
McDowell, I suppose, got um, got right. He's he's an appalling character, but he's not hateful, and it's that. And for that reason, I think it will always seem ambiguous, and that's the strength of it. I think it's true to say that you have a sneaking, more than a sneaking regard for the sheer demonic energy that Malcolm McDowell invests that character with, the character of Alex. And the weird thing about Alex is that he's a heroic figure because he seems to exist alone in a landscape devoid of other people. Um, and somehow, even though he is Mephistophelian or whatever you want to call it, you somehow root for him also, and that's very skillful. Alex is a bit of a charmer. I mean, he, he lives life to the full. You know, he enjoys what he does. Now, what he does you may not agree with, but at least he enjoys it. He doesn't go around like, mm, he, he's out there robbing and having fun, you know? <laughs> the very important thing about Alex, not so much the Droogies, but Alex, particularly in Clockwork Orange, is Alex is cleverer than his parents. He's smarter than the people around him. He listens to classical music, which they apparently would not understand because in the too few times we see them, they're sitting around a formica table in a kitchen, wondering what he does of an evening. <laughs> I distinctly remember how long he holds the shot of the boys in the car and it just goes on and on and it, it, it goes past a certain point where it is logical and meaningful and makes any sense and at that point it makes total sense, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It makes, it enters your subconscious in some profound level and it is very, very odd. You can't rid yourself of images in the movie. <laughs> is with particularly the rise of feminism is that you, you can't just blithely show a gang rape without somehow um, acknowledging the absolute awfulness and terror of it. And I find the rape scene in Clockwork Orange a really disturbing thing to watch because it seems to me there is this sort of absence of feeling in it. It's the part of Kubrick that wasn't happy with the rape scene until Malcolm McDowell started humming singing in the rain you know and he's he's a clever bastard you know what I mean because that is what makes it disturbing unquestionably you know that's why you remember it he came over to me and said uh, Mal can you dance I think we were fooling around Warren and I you know with these wonderful boots on marine boots and he said you know he just said uh, and I start. I said, "Yeah, sure, why not?" And I had the cane, and I started. Do 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 do. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. Boom, that's it. He searches all the time for that that thing that will make it lodge in a part of your somewhere between your heart and your head, you know, which is he creates a, 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 a disturbingly. A disturbing friction between between the sexy and the violent, you know, throughout the movie. You definitely feel the presence of Stanley Kubrick there. He's kind of there. You really feel the puppet master. And boy, was that guy a puppet master. He, he challenges you, the worst part of you, to be turned on, to not be turned on, to feel aroused, to not feel aroused, to feel sickened, to laugh. To, to take it seriously but to not take it seriously, to think of it as a cartoon but as deeply real, all those things. And he strikes, you know, at, he just finds the, the, your weak spot. He, he puts his finger on your temple at that point, you know. The, the music that you hear, the sprightly music, is in fact um, uh, you know, forcing in the face of the audience. You think you're very civilized, don't you? You think your art, you know, the art uh, has become so advanced that you're incapable of relapsing back into the animal world. Uh, well, think again, okay? I'm, this is the mirror I'm, I hold up to you. I think the violence is used responsibly in A Clockwork Orange. It's stylized. The fact that it's set to music keeps you at a distance from it. You're not invited into it to gloat. You're not shown really the effects of violence in the way that a Sam Peckinpah or an Oliver Stone or a Scorsese would show you today. The medical materialism of the effects of violence is absent in A Clockwork Orange. But it is the abstract effect of violence that Kubrick's genius puts into the scenes that makes its impact. The violence is so, um, so unreal and so over the top 
that it loses its kind of authenticity, perhaps, and um, is not very shocking because it's um, because it's kind of stretched. Everybody's afraid of violence, so it's really great to sort of see, a, you know, violence for no reason, and it's 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 harmful and it's harmless, and there's no one responsible for it, and you know, and all this kind of stuff kicks off, and it's I mean, you know, singing in the rain is like the perfect example, but you know, visually it's fantastic. You know, it's like snip cutting the holes out of the dress with the breast popping out. The absence of feeling or absence of understanding about what the woman is going to go through, Adrienne Corrie, the actress who played it. Um, it's very much the, the male viewpoint, and that, I think, is something that's changed in filmmaking since then. There is a kind of 70s sexual liberation kind of old-fashioned sexism about it, you know. Uh, there's something very titillating in the rape sequences, the way they're done, the way the girls are presented. That, that's counterbalanced by this incredible portrait of the male bonding and, and, and how men join together in violence and egg each other on, which is, I think Kubrick was great on that. Men in groups will tend toward pack behavior you can see the influence of this movie in my own analysis, for example, of the fraternity party Dionysian revels of the uh, 1980s that uh, led to charges of date rape, which became a prime uh, fodder for, the, for, a fe for a feminist crusade in this country and then was picked up by the media. So the the um, rather ethically neutral way in which I describe the rampaging behavior of young men in my writing on rape has uh, ruffled many feathers, but it's coming directly from what I feel was Kubrick's forthrightness in A Clockwork Orange. He shows the truth that when law and order break down, mob behavior rules. You can be appalled by it and you can abhor it. But at the same time, in the hands of a gifted filmmaker, or indeed in the hands of a filmmaker who is not gifted, it can exert uh, an almost repellent compulsion over you that you feel you have to look, and sometimes you find yourself being exhilarated by the sheer uh, physical energy of what's happening on the screen. The kind of fun house element, um, the kind of schoolboy mirth in, uh, in Kubrick's film, uh, uh, really, I think, um, caused a, a storm of abuse and an inability to process the, the artistry and the vision, the, tr the truthful vision in the film. I wonder if, you know, 30 years on, you could possibly film a scene like that now. It seems to me, in a way, completely insensitive, the way it's shot. And I, I think it's a reflection of the time, much more so than the violence in the film. The main brief that American feminism had against A Clockwork Orange was that the uh, fun element, the ebullience in, uh, in the nighttime raids and, and the rapes was so clearly evident. The fun element in tracking, in stalking, in capturing, in destroying. When I've spoken like this, feminists have gone quite mad. They said, it's not possible. There cannot, uh, rape is a crime of violence, not of sex. And I say, wake up, wake up. There is a sharpening of sexual desire in conditions uh, where uh, social order has broken down. I don't think Kubrick deals with sex in a normal way. I mean, who does? But it seemed to me a very strange world in which sex was either violent or it was comic. And that to me always struck me as strange. Uh, and not entirely healthy. The murder of the Catwoman, uh, whom Malcolm stomps to death with a huge plaster phallus, a uh, ridiculous weapon, except that those who live by the sex object die by the sex object in the film. <laughs> the Clockwork Orange is a film about the conflict between individual free will and state control. And to my mind, that's what licenses the violence that the film contains. It is a moral message about the dangers of the state adopting violence and not just the bully boys in the street. I heard talk in the 1960s 
of the possibility of getting these young thugs and not putting them in jail, because jails were needed for professional criminals, but rather putting them through a course of conditioning, turning them, in effect, into clockwork oranges. Not uh, no longer organisms full of sweetness and colour and light like oranges, but machines. Kubrick read the American version of Clockwork Orange and the final chapter was omitted. And in the English edition, the final chapter is about Alex deciding voluntarily to abandon evil, to put away his toys, as he puts it, and to become a good citizen. Um, and for Burgess, that's the point of the, of the novel, that we have free will, and it is a morality tale about free will. Crucially, the copy of the book that I had, had the final chapter on, in which, at the end, Alex kind of wanders around a shopping mall and it's Christmas and he grows up and he realises that he doesn't want to have a fight with anyone anyway. So probably the most profound difference between the book and the film is that the film ends at the wrong point. To Burgess, you know, this was part of the integrity of the novel. Um, he believed that violence was something that everybody goes through as a teenager, or young men anyway go through, but grow out of. And he felt that Kubrick didn't show the growing out of bit, uh, the adult bit. And Alex becomes an adult at the end and discards the past, and we don't see that in the movie, and that Burgess couldn't forgive Kubrick for. You're absolutely right, sir! Shut up, bleeding hole! Who said that? I did, sir. What crime did you commit? The accidental killing of a person, sir. He brutally murdered a woman, sir, in furtherance of theft. Fourteen years, sir! Excellent. He's enterprising, aggressive, outgoing, young, bold, vicious. He'll do. When Alex is uh, effectively lobotomized, becomes a clockwork orange, um, we are meant to condemn the state in the same way as we'd condemn Alex for being a thug at the beginning of the movie. But Burgess's intent was different. I think he wanted to show how uh, someone can become good voluntarily by an exercise of his own free will. You remember in the film when the padre, uh, the prison padre, who is the repository of morality and Christian morality in the film, objects to what's been done to Alex, who's been brainwashed in a very cruel fashion, the Minister of the Interior rises and he said, Padre, it works. And you know, I can hear Jack Straw, I can hear William Whitelaw, I can hear Michael Hard in those accents. And I think that that's what people will hear when they see the film today. Perhaps that's one reason why no politician will be interviewed for this programme. <laughs> that could very well be one reason why no politician wishes to be interviewed for this programme. There were allegations that it had invited or stimulated some yob gangs to behave in an imitative way. What we don't know um, at this distance is how true that was. Um, I mean, as a, as a regulator over a very long period of time, one thing I have learned is that it's not uncommon for somebody who finds himself in the dock to say, well, Gub, it's not my fault. I saw this movie or I saw this television program um, and uh, I was led to it by what I saw. And it's quite possible that there was an element of that, particularly with Clockwork Orange. There is always this worry with, with images that they do make you want to go out and copy what you've just seen. I can remember as a child going out and copying things that I'd seen on Z cars and, you know, fortunately it wasn't murdering anybody but it was, it was copying. and. This made Burgess disapprove of elements in the film and it made Kubrick, I think, worry when there were reports. Probably it seems wrong, in fact, these reports of, of acts of violence that had been inspired by a Clockwork Orange. Uh, it made him worry and I think, you know, maybe we've still not resolved this all these years later. I don't feel that violence in the media causes violence. On the contrary, I feel that it causes passivity and inaction and paralysis. It, it, a far more serious cultural problem to me. Whether there is a connection between the violence that we see on the contemporary screen and the violence that occurs in society is something that is not susceptible to objective proof. 
this attempt to blame art for uh, human evil uh, found us very quickly. The Bible has inspired more acts of violence than any one single piece of literature, yet it's still revered and widely read. You know, it's a preposterous argument, it seems to me. We all know Catcher in the Rye is the, you know, the, the, the assassin's favorite paperback. Does that mean it should be banned in schools? In some schools it is. Despite all the claims of, of sociologists that, that there are abundant studies proving a direct correlation of um, represented violence to, uh, to violence enacted, I think that the, um, it's a minuscule, minuscule uh, compared to the uh, overwhelming numbers of people, millions upon millions of people who see any given violent movie, that the, um, the seeds for violent behavior have been sown long before the individual film. Taxi Driver, who would have thought? It's a great movie, everyone agrees. It's one of the most important movies of the last 50 years. I don't think that Martin Scorsese thought that somebody watching that movie would go out and try and shoot the president. That wasn't his intention. And, and you would think that no sane or intelligent person watching the film would go out and try and shoot the president. But there was an insane person who did see it. And when you come down to that, you just think, well, what can I do, you know? If I'm, if, I, if I'm drawn, and some directors and writers are, to exploring a dark, the, the darker side of human nature, does that mean I shouldn't do it and should only make It's a Wonderful Life? Anthony Burgess died in 1993, in fact, shortly after the, the, the James Bolger trial. And he had written about the case, and he'd reflected on violence because there was a copycat theory about that case too. Whether art, which he'd always defended, literature, independence of which he'd always defended, might not have a damaging effect. And he had a sort of change of heart. He was implying that, yeah, maybe in the end he had to admit that art and literature could have a damaging effect, that they don't live in this closed-off world, that people can read them, watch things, and go out and do terrible things as a result. So he, towards the end of his life, I think he, he had his own doubts, just as Kubrick had had earlier when he'd withdrawn the film. I mean, as an artist, I do things, and I put them in front of people, and I go... I, I try and put responsibility onto the viewer, and I think I think that's what, what happened in the Clockwork Orange. I think most people who are familiar with the historical background to this were pretty confident that after Kubrick died, it was only a matter of time before Clockwork Orange was released again people will realize that we are nearer and nearer that kind of society, that the film was a forecast. Stanley used to deny to me that it was a forecast. He said, Alex, it's not a forecast, it's a fable. I would hope that people would, you know, would be shocked and startled and excited by it. And in fact, actually, I think they probably will. I think one of the reasons they will is the first half hour of Clockwork Orange is really unmatched in terms of just sheer visceral onslaught. I don't think it's um, frightening anymore in the same way as it was then. I, I think we've seen far, far worse. When these kind of kids go and see a real film, which Clockwork Orange is, made by a, a real film maker, other, rather than these, um, you know, imposters that walk around these days uh, pretending to be one, um, I, I, would, I would hope the reaction is, is very, very good. But of course Clockwork Orange stands really on its own as what it is. It's an extraordinary piece of work. But um, I think everybody that had anything to do with it uh, gave of their best. I, I think everything. And of course, I think Stanley was at his creative pinnacle. I think what's astonishing about it now is its bravery and its incredible faith in the audience to a degree as well. And, um, and the brilliance of his visual sense, which I don't think exists anymore. I mean, I just don't think the, the real shock is going to be why can't we make films like this anymore? I do think it captures a truth about the human soul that everyone must encounter and absorb. If a clockwork orange is rejected, then I'm afraid um, people have sentimentalized and censored their own view of human life. What is regarded as a terrific piece of entertainment 
um, that obviously did provoke and attract enormous amount of attention. But once the attention is gotten, what does it then say? And I'm not sure Clockwork Orange actually says that much. Its morality is, I am making a really exciting, interesting film. And no matter how much people like myself or Alexander Walker discuss what a brilliant dissection of violence that is, that's all bollocks when it comes down to the actual aesthetic of the film, which is that it's, it's the sheer pleasure and joy of exceptionally exciting filmmaking. If you're going to take on the lure of violence, then you go into a dodgy area where you have to almost be sensationalist and explore the love of violence yourself. And I think he does that, and he takes you in there, and you are attracted by it in some ways, and then you come out of it. But I think he implicates you in some ways, and that makes the film kind of still a dangerous work of art. Let's get it, boys! But it doesn't burst with youth as a piece of filmmaking. To me, I think he's saying, okay, this is about young guys and it's I want it to be sexy and I want it to appeal to to youth. So I think I'm gonna put in things that they will find attractive and he's such a clever man that he puts them in. I think Clockwork Orange was was a work that did impact hugely and eat into the lives of both Kubrick and Burgess. For Burgess, you know, there was the trauma of his first wife's rape and dealing with that um, in the writing of it. Um, and then it was being caught up in the controversy over the film. For Kubrick, it brought artistic acclaim, but also death threats, and he was forced to withdraw it. It wasn't a book they could easily put behind them. It wasn't a film Kubrick could put behind him. Um, Burgess, to the end of his life, went on thinking about the book and worrying about the film and um, they never could let it be, or it, couldn't, it wouldn't let them be. Um, it, it, uh, it just went on to the end, really. 